Hello, and welcome everyone to today's webinar on a software-controlled switched reluctance motor. Before we get started with the webinar itself, um, I'm Andrea Silvestri, and I walk you through a few webinar logistics. Today's webinar is based on a report from the Oak Ridge National Laboratory, and you can find the full report as well as a one-page infographic and four-page report summary and additional resources at gsa.gov slash gpg. Today's webinar will be recorded, and you'll be able to access the webinar recording and slides also at gsa.gov slash gpg under Outbrief Webinars. And we'll also be sending a copy of the recording and slides and the top answers to the Q&A um, following today's webinar. Today's webinar is one in a series. Our next webinar will be in January, and it will be a GSA internal webinar focused on deployment of uh, GPG technologies. Today's broadcast is set to listen only, and um, will be. But we're, uh, you can use the chat in the right-hand side of the screen, and we um, suggest that you submit questions um, that you don't wait until the end of the Q and A sessions, but you submit questions well in advance. All GPG webinars offer continuing education credit through the American Institute of Architects. And to receive credit, you can complete the post-webinar survey. Now, um, you won't receive a webinar survey unless you registered for the webinar. So if you don't receive the survey, please reach out to Michael Hobson at michael.hobson at gsa.gov. And speaking of Michael, Michael is the project manager on the, soft, on the software control switch reluctance motor, and he'll be facilitating today's webinar. Michael. Thank you, Andrea. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, next slide, please. In today's webinar, uh, we'll uh, start with having Kevin Powell, the program director, give us a brief overview of the Center for Emerging Building Technologies and the GSA Proving Ground Program. Uh, after, this in, after this overview, we will have Brian Fricke and Mahavir Bhandari from the Department of Energy's Oak Ridge National Laboratory. They will share details and results from our demonstration on software-controlled switched reluctance motors. After Brian and Mahavir's presentation, they will be followed by feedback from Mike Green and Jeremy Zawicki, uh, two individuals from the Land Port of Entry at San Ysidro, California, who were instrumental in assisting us with this demonstration. Um, Jeremy Zawicki is the property manager at the San Ysidro Land Port of Entry, and Mike Green is the uh, one of the lead engineers for the uh, operations and maintenance staff there. Uh, Mike Green was um, uh, assisted us with the installation and also provided uh, very valuable feedback throughout the demonstration and report writing process. At the end of the webinar, we will uh, then instigate the Q&A session. And like Andrea said, please insert any questions into that chat window, and we will address them as we can. Um, finally, with that, uh, let's start this out brief. Uh, Kevin, take it away. Um, thank you, Michael. And um, I feel like as I'm looking at this uh, this picture that I need to have one of those uh, Stephen Colbert uh, descriptions of what this guy looks like or something like that. Anyway, uh, I am Kevin Powell. I'm director of the Center for Emerging Building Technologies at GSA. And um, the, the key thing to, to know about our program that, uh, that we have is that it's, um, the, the intent is that there is an awful lot of innovation out there, and we're going to talk about one of uh, those innovations. Uh, the challenge is that when a company like Software Motor Company that, um, that applied to our program and was selected for our program, well, they were selected because we would believe, based on a whole lot of credible data, that they would represent a step change in motor performance, that this is, again, something that really can make an enormous impact. Um, the challenge is, and I think it would be sensible for everybody to, to, to be this way, is that we have a whole, we, basically motors are unchanged for 100 years. And, uh, you know, the, the general uh, way of thinking about things, if it's, if it's not broke, why fix it? Well, these motors we know work, 
Um, they're reliable. They last a long time, and there's a lot of them. So the, 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 you know, a reasonable question to ask is, is this motor really going to deliver in the real world? Um, and that's, that's what our program is set up to answer. Um, we're, we're basically saying for GSA, let's make sound investment decisions in next generation technology based on their actual performance, the way we install them in our buildings with the people who actually operate equipment and based on their feedback that it actually delivers. So next slide. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, again, this slide doesn't need to be any clearer than this. This motors are a huge thing, right? They, electricity, more than a third of it in our buildings is used by motors. So if you could improve the efficiency of motors, you would be doing well, we would be doing great, right? There's an enormous opportunity out there. Um, and the, the other side of this slide is that more than half of the motors that are, are making up this, um, this large amount of electricity use, just again, broadly speaking, not in GSA buildings per se, but in all commercial buildings, but more than half of them are relatively small. So they're under five horsepower. Um, so what we've done in this, um, in this project is to uh, we did this in conjunction, and I, I do need to say that it's uh, you know this is a, a a rare case, or perhaps a not so rare case, of the federal government actually working together and collectively and smartly with other federal agencies and with uh, the private sector to look at this uh, motor in a variety of contexts. Uh, the context that we took on was actually a larger motor, a 10 horsepower motor in this case. Um, that would have a pumping application. Um, there's other uh, projects that are looking at this in a in the small, much smaller size in RTUs, you know, rooftop units. Um, and there's another project that's looking at it in sort of uh, the even smaller motors that are used in uh, commercial refrigeration. Um, so with that, I'm going to actually next slide. Um, I think this, uh, well, basically what uh, we want to talk about on at, at this point is to say, hey, we have released this report. We have findings. It's published on our website. You can uh, download that. This is the four-page findings document. You could also uh, look at the full report, and there's even a one-page infographic. Um, with that, let me turn this over to the actual presentation of content, um, and that would be Brian and Mahadir. Take it away. All right. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Uh, this is Brian and my colleague, uh, Mahabir, here. Um, so uh, let's see. I guess we'll go ahead and, uh, to the next slide. Um, just a little bit of background before we uh, you know, dig into the meat of the, of the project, um, talk a little bit about motors. Um, so uh, all electric motors uh, use the interaction of uh, magnetic fields to create uh, rotation. So uh, one type of motor, uh, the AC induction motor, which has been around for uh, over 100 years, uh, relies on electromagnetic uh, induction to create this uh, rotating uh, magnetic field. And so in these motors, uh, there's no uh, magnets uh, used. Um, a recent alternative uh, to uh, induction motors, uh, you may be familiar with uh, permanent magnet AC motors. Uh, these actually uh, use uh, rare earth magnets. Uh, to create uh, the rotating magnetic field. Uh, so next slide. Um, so inherently, uh, AC induction motors are fixed speed. Um, uh, the variable frequency drive was introduced in the 80s to allow AC motors to operate uh, at variable speed. Um, and while VFDs allow uh, systems to operate at part load, uh, these devices are a resistance, an electrical resistance uh, in the system, and thus they reduce the overall system efficiency. And additionally, uh, they're an additional cost uh, to the system. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, an alternative motor technology uh, is the switched reluctance motor. Uh, this type of motor has been used in the past, uh, mainly for uh, zero fault tolerance applications. Uh, such as you might see uh, in the nuclear industry. And this is primarily due uh, to the simplicity and robustness 
uh, of the switched reluctance uh, motor. However, uh, these motors uh, require very complex controls and they are typically noisy, and so they've not widely been used uh, in building applications. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the motor that was evaluated uh, in this GSA demonstration uh, is a new software-controlled high rotor pole switched reluctance motor. Um, that's a mouthful to say, uh, so I'll just simply call it a smart motor. Um, so recent advances in electronics and controls have made the switched reluctance motor uh, feasible for a broader range of applications. Um, the smart motor is robust. It doesn't have any rotor windings or magnets. Uh, and it can be precisely controlled uh, through the built-in microprocessors and sensors uh, in the motor. Next slide. Uh, so here uh, I show a cross-section of uh, an AC induction motor as well as the traditional switch reluctance motor and the new smart motor. Um, so in the AC induction motor, uh, a current and then hence a magnetic field uh, is induced in the rotor uh, when the coils are energized. Uh, and so that's shown on the, on the left there. Uh, in the middle is the switched reluctance motor. And in this particular type of motor, uh, the magnetic field generated by the energized coils passes through the rotor and forces a pair of rotor poles uh, to line up with the uh, poles of the coil. Uh, so if you look in uh, at that figure in the center there, uh, that particular configuration that's shown there, uh, coils, the coil A has been energized and then the rotor poles one and four are lining up with that energized uh, coil. So then the next step in the process would be to de-energize de de uh, coil A and then energize coil B. And then the magnetic flux coming out of the coil B there uh, would force uh, poles uh, three and six. Uh, to line up, thereby you know, creating the rotation. So uh, the traditional switched reluctance motor, uh, which is shown in the center there, uh, has more uh, poles on the coil uh, than it does in the rotor, uh, whereas uh, the new smart motor or the high rotor pole switched reluctance motor uh, has more poles on the rotor uh, than it does in the coil. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so before we talk about uh, you know, details of the uh, demonstration, I want to make a comment here about uh, motor efficiency. Um, so in this plot, uh, we see uh, the efficiency of uh, NEMA standard and a NEMA premium efficient motor uh, plotted as a function of rated motor power. Uh, so a general trend uh, that you can take away from this plot is that lower power motors have lower efficiency uh, compared to the higher power motors. And so those, you know, the, the standard efficiency and premium efficiency uh, efficiencies are shown uh, with the gray and uh, green lines. And then also on the plot is the efficiency of the new smart motor, uh, which is shown there in orange. Um, and so you can see that the uh, new smart motor is more efficient than either uh, the standard efficiency or premium efficient uh, NEMA motors. And you know, particularly uh, in the case of uh, the lower uh, horsepower motors, you can see a significant uh, increase in the efficiency for the smart motor. Okay, next slide, please. So in this uh, GSA demonstration that Oak Ridge National Laboratory did, uh, you know, a 10 horsepower smart motor uh, provided by the uh, software motor company uh, was evaluated both in a laboratory setting and at a test site. And so the uh, test site M and V was uh, performed at the uh, land port of entry in San Ysidro, California. Next slide, please. Okay, for the laboratory evaluation, uh, the performance of a 10 horsepower smart motor and a 10 horsepower premium efficiency AC induction motor with a VFD uh, were compared uh, using a dynamometer operated under uh, tightly controlled conditions. And then for the uh, site demonstration, uh, the performance of a 10 horsepower smart motor was compared to that of a, an existing 10 horsepower premium efficiency AC induction motor with a VFD. 
uh, in a chilled water pumping application at the land port of entry in San Ysidro. Uh, next slide, please. So jumping uh, into the uh, results, uh, so here we see some of the test results from the laboratory evaluation. And what you see here are plots of efficiency uh, as a function of percent full load torque at three different uh, motor speeds. And you know, we can see, so the, the blue line is the uh, NEMA premium efficient motor, and then the red line is the efficiency of the smart motor. And so for all three speeds that we've got plotted here, we can see that in all of these cases, uh, the smart motor was more efficient uh, than the premium efficiency AC induction motor. And you can further note that the difference in efficiency becomes more pronounced uh, at lower speeds. So the, uh, the smart motor is able to uh, maintain its efficiency uh, operating at full speed and lower speeds. So uh, from the laboratory evaluation, we found that on average for uh, the range of speeds that we tested and the loads, uh, the 10 horsepower smart motor was 4.5% more efficient uh, than a premium efficiency AC induction motor in uh, VFD drive. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, so on to the uh, uh, evaluation at the land port of entry. Uh, for the pumping application there, it was found that the smart motor was more efficient than the premium efficiency motor uh, and drive for a given operating condition. So I should note that for the pumping system that was evaluated there at the land port of entry, uh, it displayed two operating modes, uh, what I call a, a lower pressure differential mode and a higher pressure differential mode, uh, where the pressure difference across the pump uh, and the delivered hydraulic power of the pump showed two distinct uh, trends. And then and a further note, uh, also during this demonstration, uh, a new section of the building was brought online uh, that the chillers served. So in order to fairly compare uh, the incumbent motor and the smart motor, uh, the data was normalized according to these two observed uh, operating conditions, the low pressure differential mode and the high uh, pressure differential mode. And for both of these modes of operation, the smart motor was found to be anywhere from 3.7% to 5.3% more efficient than the premium efficiency motor. Uh, next slide, please. Um, in addition to the evaluation that Oak Ridge National Laboratory did uh, in the laboratory and the field site in San Ysidro, uh, this smart motor technology has also been evaluated by the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. Uh, in their evaluation, they compared side by side uh, the performance of a smaller one and a half horsepower smart motor uh, with a baseline one and a half horsepower induction motor uh, in a condenser fan application uh, in a refriger commercial refrigeration system. Next slide, please. So uh, during the course of their study, NREL found uh, that compared to the baseline motor with a VFD drive, uh, the new smart motor provided 33% energy savings. And then also uh, when comparing the smart motor to a fixed speed, condenser fan motor, uh, the energy savings was uh, even greater. Uh, in, and in that case, it was uh, on the order of 71%. So again, I want to point out that uh, the NREL study uh, investigated a smaller horsepower motor than uh, the Oak Ridge study uh, that I just presented here. Um, so you know, with the smaller horsepower motors, there is uh, you know, more potential for energy savings. So, OK, next slide, please. So uh, other aspects uh, of the GSA uh, demonstration uh, included installation, operation, and maintenance characteristics uh, of the smart motor. So uh, in terms of installation, uh, the smart motor installation uh, was found to be identical to that of all other motors. Uh, the smart motors are manufactured uh, with standard frame sizes, uh, so they bolt directly in place of existing motors. And for the chilled water pump application, uh, used in the GSA demonstration at San Ysidro, uh, 
uh, about 12 hours of labor was required to install the motor, and that included uh, laser alignment of the pump and motor shafts. Uh, for the condenser fan demonstration that was performed by NREL, uh, installation time was on the order of two to four hours. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, in terms of maintenance, uh, the bearings of the smart motor are sealed, and so no regular lubrication or maintenance of the bearings are required, and so it, you know, it would be expected then that maintenance uh, would be reduced for the smart motor. Next slide. Um, the uh, 10 horsepower smart motor that was tested at San Ysidro uh, was a pre-production model and it was noted that it was significantly louder uh, than the existing premium efficiency induction motor. So uh, 94 dB on A weighted uh, for the smart motor versus uh, 79 dB A weighted for the baseline motor. Uh, Facility staff at San Ysidro noted that uh, hearing protection would be required uh, when working around the smart motor uh, if it were in enclosed spaces. Uh, the smart motor manufacturer uh, recognizes uh, the issue and they've been working to resolve uh, the noise issue and uh, they claim with their most recent uh, 20 horsepower prototype uh, operating at a 10 horsepower load uh, that it produces, the new uh, prototype produces a noise level on the order of 81 dB. Uh, Oak Ridge has not uh, verified this claim uh, at this time. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the uh, drive uh, for the smart motor uh, does not include an LCD display as is common for traditional VFD drives. So there the photo on the on the right shows a traditional uh, VFD and you can see the little uh, LCD screen uh, on there. So uh, facility staff uh, at San Ysidro uh, miss being able to directly read operating and performance parameters uh, from the drive itself. Uh, however, it should be noted uh, that a computer can be connected directly uh, to the smart motor drive to view and set operating parameters. Next slide, please. So the smart motor uh, does include uh, cloud-based connectivity uh, for remote monitoring and control, and this also allows for fault detection and diagnostics. Uh, these, test, uh, these capabilities were not tested uh, in the GSA demonstration uh, due to the timeline required to obtain IT security clearance. However, uh, these capabilities were evaluated uh, in the NREL study uh, and it proved useful uh, when a piece of foam had lodged itself into uh, one of the condenser fans. Uh, so you can see a figure, a photo there on the right uh, in that orange uh, circle is a piece of foam lodged there in the, in the fan. So uh, the uh, remote monitoring capabilities of the smart motor was able to alert uh, the team of a fault occurring uh, and so uh, the fan motor was remotely turned off to prevent motor damage. Next slide, please. Uh, the new uh, smart motor uh, is about half the cost of the incumbent premium efficiency uh, AC induction motor and drive. Uh, so uh, based on information uh, from the San Ysidro uh, engineering team, uh, premium efficiency AC induction motor and drive uh, would cost uh, approximately $4,400. Um, versus the smart motor uh, and its drive, uh, which would cost a little over $2,400. Uh, I should note that the smart motor is manufactured in China and uh, Buy America waiver uh, would need to be purchased or would, be, would need to be uh, in place in order to purchase these motors for uh, GSA applications. Uh, next slide, please. So here uh, we have a, a table summarizing the uh, economic assessment of the motor. And so uh, given that the smart motor is less expensive uh, than the premium efficiency induction motor and drive, and also given that the smart motor is more efficient, uh, the smart motor provides an immediate payback uh, for end of life replacement. 
applications. However, uh, in a retrofit application, uh, the payback period is pretty long at over uh, 20 years. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of deploying the smart motor technology, uh, smaller horsepower motors uh, offer the greatest relative savings, uh, as we saw with the NREL uh, demonstration where they had savings of uh, on the order of 33 to 70% versus the pumping application at San Ysidro where it was on the order of 4 or 5%. Uh, savings uh, can more than double uh, when replacing a motor without a VFD uh, with the smart uh, motor. And uh, another opportunity is since there's a large number of RTUs in commercial uh, office spaces, uh, there's a large opportunity to deploy a smart motor in HVAC fan uh, retrofits. And then finally, uh, the cloud-based connectivity and fault detection capabilities of the smart motor uh, could be uh, beneficial to the GSA. Next slide, please. So in terms of uh, use cases, uh, the best case for deployment of the uh, smart motor would be uh, for end-of-life replacement, again, because you know the smart motor is cheaper than the incumbent technology and provides a little bit of an energy benefit. Uh, in terms of retrofit, uh, replacing constant speed motors uh, with the variable speed smart motor uh, would be a, an attractive option. Uh, as well as replacing motors of uh, less than five horsepower or replacing fan motors. Okay, next slide. And so with that, uh, I guess what I'll do now is turn it over to uh, Mike Green and uh, Jeremy Sawiggy from uh, uh, San Ysidro Land Point of uh, Entry uh, to provide their feedback and experiences uh, regarding the use of the smart motor. Hello, this is Jeremy Sawick with San Ysidro Port of Entry. Um, are you hearing me okay? Yes. Yes, okay, we hear you, Jeremy. Thank you. Thanks. Um, yeah, so to, to recover some of these uh, slides, we've already um, kind of went into the installation of the motor on site here. Um, just to recap, uh, the installation time was uh, less consuming than a traditional um, motor. Um, and it takes a, a, the 12 hours in order to uh, fully install it. Um, let's see. Uh, um, so the fan motor installation would be two to four hours just for the for the motor itself. Next slide. Um, the maintenance um, also um, was already covered. It's in a sealed bearing, so there's no maintenance on the bearing. Next slide. Um, the operations, um, this was probably the most significant impact to uh, the building and tenants and to the um, maintenance staff was the, the noise. We didn't um, confirm any of these numbers, but it was significantly louder than the uh, existing um, pump motors that we had. Um, next slide. Oh, well, I can talk about the VFD screens, too. The, the real-time adjustments for the VFDs was also an issue for uh, uh, adjusting the, uh, the percentages of the motor we needed um, for troubleshooting and also for, uh, uh, for any issues that arise with the, with the pump operation. Um, for recommendations, um, I guess uh, deploying uh, based on performance, cost savings and potential long-term savings from a more robust motor design with less maintenance. Test new designs to ensure that the noise issue has been resolved, as we stated, and uh, for uh, integration with um, the automation system, we'd have to clear the software with GSA IT. Next slide. And any question and answers, um, we can we can help you out with any specific questions you have on any of the slides that we, we covered with installation, operations, and maintenance. We we'll also have the chief engineer here for any technical questions that you might have. Thank you, Jeremy. 
Um, and thank you everyone else uh, that participated. So what we've been doing is we've been collecting some of the questions that we have been appearing in the chat window and we're going to hopefully address some of those. Um, if you have any questions or come or think of anything um, in the next 15, 20 minutes, go right ahead and include those. Um, on our, when we deliver the recorded session, we also will deliver some of the top questions and answers that come from this presentation. Um, all right, so I see that lots of people are typing. Appreciate that. Um, we're doing our best to collect all of this information and disseminate it as best as we can. So I'm going to start here talking about one of the first questions. I think it was Keith Welch that gave uh, that asked about the, the name of the company. The name of the company we work with, and this was a special agreement or a special arrangement through the GSA Proving Ground program. We worked with the Software Motor Corporation who uh, developed this motor. Um, I do believe that there are other companies that are developing similar motors, but we worked with SMC on this. Um, they provided the technology and uh, we were able to uh, work with them throughout the process. Um, <clears throat> so a question here that I'm going to direct to uh, SMC or uh, Sam uh, from SMC, I believe is on the line. I think David is as well. If you guys would unmute, you, unmute yourself. Uh, we were received a question regarding the high number of poles in the motor and what is the benefit of having a high number of poles. Could you answer that for us? Sure. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so Hi. a very quick brief answer would be uh, it reduces the arc distance between two poles. Uh, that provides more, resolu more resolution for the rotor to, across the stator, which reduces the amount of energy required to pull the rotor um, across one step. So someone pointed out a, a IEEE paper in the chat. That's a very good paper. And it's written by some of the co-inventors and co-advisors uh, for SMC's SRM technology. So for a more technical dive, I'd refer back to that paper. Excellent. Thank you, Shams. And we will provide that link for everyone in our next um, deliverable. Um, next question here from Alex Bulk, um, or actually a statement. Um, Alex, thank you for locating that article on uh, the improvement due to greater number of rotor poles. Um, next question is from Todd Cronline. Um, what analysis was done regarding reliability and maintenance other than for the bearings? And I'll, I'll relay that to the Oak Ridge team. So uh, the evaluation period for uh, this particular project was pretty short, uh, so just on the order of a few months. So uh, we didn't have sufficient time to uh, really address any long-term reliability uh, issues and, and maintenance associated with that. Um, so definitely, uh, you know, uh, you know a future study, you know, a long-term uh, reliability study would uh, uh, would be beneficial. Uh, Brian, another question. Um, if the motor controller gets damaged from, say, an electrical spike, can that controller be replaced independent of the motor itself? That, uh, I don't know if you can answer that, Brian, or if that's something that Shams needs to, to look at. So the, the motor controller and the motor itself are two separate units, so uh, they can be replaced individually, yes. Great, thank you. Um, there was a question out there about um, connection to the network. We, we discussed remote access, cloud-based services. Um, were there uh, any cybersecurity concerns with this motor and how are they addressed? So um, I'll start by saying that any technology installed in a federal facility uh, that has remote access requires IT security screening. Um, this is a um, well-known requirement. Um, we did not utilize the remote access capabilities for this demonstration because of the, the length of time required to do that screening. Um, we did not pursue cyber clearance. And as Kevin Powell mentioned, uh, we wanted to validate the motor performance first. Um, if we do deploy this as a future, into a future project, we would definitely need to obtain the cyber clearance. Um, but the timeline was not working for this demonstration, and we chose to uh, work around that. So we did not have remote access on this demonstration. But this is something you will definitely need uh, as a requirement to any federal facility. 
Um, so I have a, a number of questions here that came up that I'm going to direct to, to Shams and um, uh, David Miles on some of the details of the motor. Um, one of the things that we realized with this motor is it doesn't have a, a display or a screen that could give uh, live updates on how the performance is. Um, will something like that be incorporated in the future? Yes, yeah, so we're working on a mobile app that allows that would allow commissioning and configuration of uh, the motor controller at the time of install. Um, that's a primary uh, use case we find for that HMI interface, the human machine interface. And it's there's a secondary benefit of not uh, having controls there, which is it prevents any unauthorized changing of controller parameters. So by forcing commissioning configuration through either an app or software or the uh, web-based tools are available when the system is connected to the internet, it creates an audit log. And that's important, right? The statistic we've heard is almost 30 to 50% of VFDs tend to be bypassed in uh, the commercial environments that we're targeting, right? So retail and smaller uh, restaurant type facilities. Great, thank you, Sam. Um, while we're at it, a few other questions here. Um, uh, let's talk a little bit about warranty. Can you give us some details on what a typical warranty would look like for your product? For, let's, let's say for a product uh, that is, um, a, a, say, five horsepower. I, I don't know if there's a difference between the different horsepower that you provide, but let's talk about something around the five horsepower. What would a warranty look like? Yeah, the, the, so the, the motors themselves um, have a, a three-year three-year warranty. Um, the um, uh, the drive or the, the motor controller, as we call it, uh, comes with a, a standard 12-month warranty. <laughs> Thank so, you, David. And that, that's across the, that's across the board for all four horsepower uh, motors and drives. <laughs> Another question about these motors, um, how many of these are in real-world applications in industry? I, I, that's from Edwin uh, Willite, and I'm thinking that, I think the question is how many of these motors are actually out there? Um, let, let, me, let, me try and, um, let me try and answer that the best way I can. So, um, so bear in mind that as it relates to software motor company, we're a relatively young um, startup company breaking into a you know, a market that is dominated by uh, a number of large players. So we have, um, in the last year, we've been coming out of um, uh, going into more of a revenue generating mode. So we, we have a number of, a large number of um, customers evaluating the technology. Um, uh, and I would say that um, uh, there are the numbers in the hundreds right now. The, ma the majority of the customers are broadly spread across uh, the commercial um, uh, spectrum, uh, primarily in the retail and um, uh, restaurant industries. Uh, one of our largest customers is in the agricultural space. Uh, so, uh, so we're driving um, uh, very large um, 55 and 72 inch fans with um, uh, direct drive to those motors. So in, in that space, there's some other advantages because uh, they've historically been belt-driven systems, um, which um, introduce um, some unreliability in the environment they're used in. So, you know, these, these are bar big dairy dairy barns, especially that get washed down regularly, and um, we're able to direct drive those. So we have several hundred uh, in that space, and uh, you know, several hundred customers. Um, uh, uh, have been evaluating the technology, and, and a number of those are now um, going into a full rollout. Um, and you know, we're starting to see um, orders of several hundred units per customer coming in right now. <clears throat> so it's early days, um, um, but the the, the 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 pilots we've been running have been very successful. Uh, people are very happy with the technology. Um, they're very happy that we can actually remotely diagnose and um, remotely monitor the system. And I know that wasn't part of the, the, the GSA trial, but that's been a, a huge value add to some customers who are able to 
um, uh, be more reactive about any maintenance that they, they might need in the system because we're actually able to tell much more than just the motor's broken. Uh, it could be something like a fan belt is broken on a on a on a um, uh, you, you, in a HVAC unit, for instance, and we can we can tell by the by the um, uh, by the metrics we're able to get from the motor, we're able to to kind of um, uh, provide some of that information. <clears throat> Thank you, David. Okay, um, how about uh, one of the other questions are to see if we can have some cut sheets available or provided on the motor in the VFD combo. Um, can you provide that to us, and can we share that with everyone? In the yeah, yeah. What's the, what's the best way for us to get those to you and distribute those? I mean, we can certainly provide those. Yeah. <clears throat> well, they're also um, available on the SMC website. So if you browse to yeah. softwaremotor.com/learningcenter, uh, you'll find all the data sheets there as well. Excellent, excellent. We'll make sure we share that with everyone in our next communication on this. Um, I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about installation. This is our next question here about installation labor. Mike Green, you might be able to help us with this. Um, what was the need for the 12 hours and um, the laser alignment? Could you provide a little bit more detail on how the installation went? So the installation that we did, we utilized the existing ABB drive as a disconnecting means for the motor because the new SMC motor didn't have a disconnect built into the controls, so that would have been a standalone deal. So we used our ABB drive as a disconnecting means, and then we had to run new conduit from that drive to the controller, and then from the controller back down to the SMC motor. And then after we mounted the motor to the base plate, we used our fiber line laser alignment tool to get the side-to-side, -side, up and down, and camber within two thousandths to prevent premature bearing and seal failure of the bell and gossip motor, I mean the bell and gossip pump, and shoot, that's about it really. Thanks Mike. I'm not sure if that's, if that's, uh, if that's what they're after or yeah, I think that, that answers the question and if there is more questions we can definitely address those uh, at a, another time. Um, let's keep going here. I, first, I, thank you everyone for all your feedback. We've got a lot of questions here. It's great to see how everyone's engaged in this and uh, there's a lot of interesting uh, inquiries here. So let me continue uh, with a few questions back to SMC. Um, one of the things about RTUs and package AC units is they're typically sold as a system. Um, we don't have uh, a lot of insight on exactly how the NREL demonstration went. We know that there's a report out. We provided the link to for everyone to see that report. But could you give us a little information about uh, whether or not it makes sense to replace motors inside one of those systems or one of those um, RTU systems or components? Or David, I think you understand what I'm saying. You might you might be on mute. Sorry, was that was that directed to myself? Um, yeah, to you or Shams, if you could tell us if it makes sense to replace motors inside a already packaged um, rooftop unit or AC unit. Yeah. So, so yeah, that that's one of the primary markets we're addressing right now, and we, we're seeing um, uh, a huge success with that as it relates to um, uh, our, our one to five horsepower motors, uh, and, uh, and, and we're starting to see more um, ten horsepower motors going into that space as well right now. So typically, what's happening is customers are finding uh, they can get some um, huge energy savings from uh, replacing, uh, pr primarily they're replacing fixed speed induction motors with with a variable speed um, solution, um, and and gaining from the, the benefits of the additional uh, efficiency they get from our motors as well as the, um, the benefits you get from uh, putting in place a, a variable speed uh, solution. Um, so in a, in a heating and ventilating application, that would be, depending on the heating and ventilating mode you're in, you're running the motor at different speeds in order to be able to um, uh, uh, reduce your energy consumption. So that's, the, that's one of our big markets right now and we, we, 
particularly in the retail, um, commercial building, and um, restaurant space, we're seeing a, a lot of interest in that solution. <laughs> Thank you, David. Another question about uh, competitors. Are there other U.S. companies looking to manufacture motors like this that you're aware of? Uh, well, I, I, not that we're aware of, and, and we have some. One of the things that was talked about was the uh, earlier on was the um, uh, the architecture of our motor, where we have a um, we we change the configuration to uh, have a, a greater number of rotor poles to stator poles. Uh, there is a lot of um, we have a number of patents that protect um, that model, um, and there is also a huge investment in the software to drive these motors to be able to um, maximize the efficiency of the motors. And, and, and that's not to be underestimated. You know, there's um, uh, several tens of man years of software effort um, invested in the in the design of the uh, motor controller that helps us maximize the not just the efficiency, but the overall performance of the motor in, in its given application. Um, so we're not aware of anyone right now that is, um, uh, is showing any signs of, of manufacturing this type of motor. Um, they would um, they would probably run into some of our patents if they tried to try to um, uh, uh, reinvent it. So uh, that's all, that's all I'd say on that one. <clears throat> okay. There's a note here from someone on the call that mentions that ABB provides these motors. Are you? I'm not sure what ABB is. Um, I, I don't know if that's something you're aware of. Well, the, the, I'm, yeah. So ABB provides something called a synchronous reluctance motor. It's a similar, uh, you know, similar basic technology, but very different in the implementation. And the other thing I'll say is that there is a there's a um, uh, there is another large motor manufacturer, NIDEC, N I D E C, is a, a Japanese-based company. Um, they they acquired um, some switch reluctance motors from a uh, a UK company several years ago. They do manufacture those motors. Um, they uh, they are made for very um, specific applications and. If you try and buy one, they're very hard to buy unless you've got very large um, uh, order quantities. It's essentially an OEM kind of type solution. Uh, they are not efficient and they're very noisy, is, is I guess, uh, our experience with those motors. <laughs> okay. Thank you, David. Let's continue here with the question about integrating with the building system. Um, uh, how does the motor tie into the BMS? Can it talk through BACnet, back net, for example? Yes, we have a gateway device called a supervisor, uh, which can communicate a number of BMS protocols, uh, BACnet IP, Modbus RTU, uh, BACnet MSTP is coming up as well. And the motor itself is some models are capable of talking Modbus RTU directly to BMS. Um, others are, or future models are going to have BACnet uh, built in as well. And, and then to, to basically set up the motor, do you need a computer to set the motor up, or is that, or is that the only option, or is there other ways to set up the motor? No. At the, well, at the time we did this study at the San Isidro LPOE, uh, that was the only option. But since then, we've, uh, we're adding a mobile app to allow commissioning. And for most of our customers, the systems are pre-configured before it ships out. So. Um, you either you can either receive a plug and play system, or uh, if there's internet connectivity, it allows you to remotely log in, upload a file, which is a much much faster process than um, configuring each parameter on site. Thank you, Shem. Um, I let's uh, switch first. Uh, if we've still got a few minutes left here, if anyone has any questions, now is the chance to get them on that chat window. We're um, we're running. Uh, we're we're wrapping up. Uh, some of the questions that we have currently. So uh, I uh, thank you, ev everyone, for your um, participation. Um, one of the questions came up, and this is something I think Brian, you'd be able to answer, or or Mahavir. Um, how did the how did you identify typical motors that are in federal buildings that um, 
compare to compare to this technology and then uh, would be recommended for widespread deployment. So I guess the Baldar motor, I guess what what was it that made you um, choose that type of motor to utilize as a typical motor use in the federal portfolio? So I, I think, you know, our, you know, reason for choosing like this pumping application, um, you know, there are, at the time were some ongoing and, you know, maybe still uh, going on studies uh, using that motor in fan applications, either uh, like the condenser fan application that I had mentioned about in rel, or I, I believe there's some ongoing work with uh, using this in uh, RTUs. Uh, so, um, you know, I think there's several uh, studies you know, related to use as fans. So we thought, you know, uh, you know, large buildings typically have chillers, and so that would be another uh, fairly significant application of, of uh, motors. And they're, you know, on the order of five to ten horsepower motors in those uh, applications. So uh, that's why we uh, decided to go with a ten horsepower uh, motor in a pumping application. Um, another question about the measurement about. Um, so the question is, uh, did you measure shaft currents on both motors? Uh, we did not measure uh, shaft currents uh, on the motors. Um, I do know that uh, at the land port of entry site, they had issues with their existing induction motors uh, and having, you know, premature bearing uh, failure due to arcing across the, the bearings, you know, uh, However, and, you know, SMC, I think they could jump in and, you know, provide more details about this. Uh, but inherent to the design of, the, of their motor, uh, there are no currents induced in the rotor, uh, so there would be no arcing uh, across the bearings of the motor. Yeah, yeah. So, so just to add to that, um, uh, fundamentally, that, as Brian says, that, that there's no mechanism to generate um, currents in the shaft of the motor as there is in, on an induction motor. Um, you know, the, whole, the, the induction motor works on the premise that you're actually inducing a current into the rotor, whereas um, the switch on electrical motors uh, is purely an electromagnetic field that uh, makes the, 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 um, uh, the rotor rotate. Um, and we, in the very early days of um, building our motors, uh, we wanted to make sure of that as well, and we had um, uh, we had our motors independently tested to verify that there are no um, shaft currents, um, and, and and that that testing was done by Aegis, who the, the company that makes uh, shaft grounding rings. So they they had a, a vested interest in trying to um, uh, trying to find shaft currents because they wanted to sell us their their, their grounding rings. Um, so the answer is we we do not have any shaft current in our motors. Okay, well, what about power factor or harmonics? Um, did we test that at all? Did we look into that at all? Uh, so in the testing that we did, you know, both in the laboratory and then at the site, we did not uh, measure or, you know, test for harmonics or power factor. Um, you know, basically what we did was recorded real power uh, going to the motor slash drive and then measured output to determine efficiency. So we did not look at power factor or, or harmonics. But, you know, that is certainly, that's a good question. You know, that would be, you know, some useful information. And I don't know, you know, if SMC could maybe comment on, uh, you know, power factor and, and harmonics uh, of their uh, particular motor and drive. Yeah, so the harmonics and power factor for our controllers are essentially uh, the same as what a commercial VFD would uh, would show. There's no, so that there's an option to add additional power factor correction and harmonics mitigation devices. And in fact, when our motors are used in IEC applications, so in Europe, uh, there's a kit that can be added with filters and surge arresters to meet the CE or rather the IEC. Uh, configuration requirements. In the US, though, in commercial usage, we 
find that the market's not able to support the extra cost of these items, and so users will go without them. Well, thank you. Thank you, Sam. So we've got a few more minutes here, actually a couple minutes. Um, we're not going to be able to get through all of the questions, but I'm going to uh, address one of them um, from Marcus Zeller. Uh, do these motors operate at typical speeds of 1,800, 3,600, 1,200, 900 uh, RPM? Yes, uh, they do. And one unique uh, element about switch reluctance motors is they're uh, Quite, they're capable of higher speeds than traditional induction motors or permanent magnet motors. So, for example, we've tested motors up to uh, 10,000 RPM. Obviously, they're not rated at that use, so I can't say you'd want to use them commercially. That would have to go through UL certification. But, uh, you know, the same motor is capable of higher speeds depending on the bearings, et cetera. Now, the speeds that are listed, 1,836, uh, 12 and 900 RPM, those are all, you know, based on a full configuration for an AC induction motor. We support all of those, and in fact, the same motor model is capable of the full range from 900 to 3600 RPM, for example, in our uh, one, two, three horsepower motors. That's and that's due to the torque production, right? Go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say that's actually an important factor to consider because unlike um, induction motors where you select a you know a 900 RPM or a 1200 or 1800 RPM motor, um, these motors um, can deliver the full horsepower range o over over that entire speed range. Um, so it's, um, it's another it's another benefit of the motor technology. <laughs> All right, we're going to uh, get through a couple more questions here. One of the questions about the laboratory test, um, is the test standard from IEEE or IEC available? Is that something that was included in the report? Um, so the, uh, the laboratory testing uh, that was performed uh, was done by uh, an outfit called Advanced Energy uh, in uh, Raleigh, North Carolina. You know, you know, with oversight by Oak Ridge National Lab and you know they utilize you know they tested uh, to a standard and I apologize I don't recall right off the top of my head what the what the number or you know what that exact standard is but um, yeah it was it was done according to industry uh, standards for evaluating the performance of electric motors they will right. send that number later Another good question here. Let's keep moving. Um, I, so I understand the controller accepts a number of inputs, such as from multi-stage T-STAT, 0 to 10 volt, or BAS, et cetera. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. Yes, that, that's correct. Hello, shout out to Craig. He's one of our strongest supporters at these uh, webinars. In, in, in addition to that, the, the motor controller can be programmed to Act on those um, uh, those um, uh, control inputs. So it, it it runs a kind of visual programming language to be able to um, uh, program how the motor reacts to those different inputs. All right, uh, the last one I think we're going to have, there's a question about user evaluations um, and if there's any major issues with the, the motor per the user. So um, in, in all of our GPG demonstrations, we always have an aspect where we interview the users. Um, in this case, it would be the O&M team and Mike Green, who was uh, part of this presentation today, did give us some feedback on that. In the, in the reporting, that there will be some more details about the installation and about the operation of this technology as we typically do with all of our demonstrations. So that information is going to be included in our report. Um, Mike Green, I don't know if you want to give any comments about uh, your overview of the operation or installation and operation of this technology other than what you've already told us.
Um, yeah, 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 absolutely. So the installation went fairly, fairly typical. Um, the motor did what it was supposed to do. The only, the only issue was just the noise. Everything else was perfect. It worked just like it was supposed to do. There was no change in flow. Everything performed like it was supposed to. Thanks, Mike. And that brings us to our final question about the, the noise issue. And we did um, talk about this briefly in the presentation regarding the fact that the motor we used was a, um, a new model. It was a, a developmental model. Um, we, there has been uh, additional testing done related to the noise. We know that that noise level that we experience at San Ysidro uh, is lower than it was or is, it has reduced in future um, development of this motor. David Miles, I'll give you an opportunity to talk about that briefly, if you could. Yeah, so, so, uh, so let me preface this just to say that um, no noise is something that has been synonymous with switch reluctance motor technology. It's, 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 it's probably the, the primary negative um, uh, factor as it, as it relates to that type of motor. Um, uh, Brian, I think in the full report has done, Brian from Oak Ridge in the full report has done a fairly good job of characterizing why that noise exists. And uh, it, it's a, it's a quite a complicated problem to address, but the, the good news is um, we have found a solution that mitigates um, nearly all of that noise and, and the testing we are doing right now in our labs and we're, we're doing this in conjunction with with ANSYS um, uh, uh, in order to be able to create um, some design modeling tools um, that will allow us to uh, really make sure that our motors, uh, future motor designs are, uh, are going to be lo low noise so we, we can model that in, in, a, in, a, in a, uh, software tools uh, and then uh, create uh, new motor design. But the motors we're testing right now in our labs uh, um, under most operating conditions are pretty much on a par with um, other induction motor technologies. Maybe just a little bit noisier, but not, not in, in the sense that you would actually uh, object to the noise that's coming from those motors. Um, Certainly, from from the results that um, the noise measurement results that um, uh, Oak Ridge measured on the motors that were installed at um, uh, San Ysidro, uh, we've significantly reduced the noise on a 20 horsepower motor. Um, so we have we've, we've elected to uh, prototype 20 horsepower motors and um, a two horsepower motor. And the two horsepower motors are currently uh, being um, evaluated in um, some commercial applications with commercial customers and they are um, completely happy that we have mitigated the noise on uh, that particular motor uh, compared to um, our, our previous two horsepower motors where it's being used in a noise sensitive application. One of the things I will say where we've been putting the motors in RTUs on rooftops um, uh, 90, 95 percent of the time, noise is not an issue there. Um, it's um, it, it's in a kind of benign environment, and um, it's away from um, uh, any areas that um, uh, you know occupants of the building would would experience that noise. Um, uh, unfortunately, as you go to the larger motors, like the, the 10 horsepower motors, the noise kind of increases, you know, as per the horsepower of the motor. So it's very important to address that noise there. So. Like I said, we, we believe we've mitigated that noise now on, um, the, on the large motors and the small motors, and we're in the process of um, productizing that and creating production, production models from, from, from those prototype designs. Okay. Thanks, so David. Um, and there's a question about what the noise sounds like. I would just describe it as a, as a very uh, weak whine. Um, uh, nothing that's going to blow your eardrums away, but it will get down to, into your nerves if it's, you're exposed to it for a very long time. And that was just the experience of San Ysidro, but of course, um, SMC has been making improvements in that. I'm going to leave it one more question, and then we're done. I appreciate everyone staying late for this. 
a lot of stuff to cover, a lot of in interest in this. And uh, what, the final question, we're going to talk about cost. And I'll leave this open to anyone that can answer it. But uh, the, co the, the cost of these motors, how does it compare to the cost of comparable permanent magnet motors? Anybody want to take that one? Shams, I don't know if you have any experience with permanent magnet motors. What I would say as it relates to a NEMA premium induction motor, um, our list prices are generally, you know, you, you mentioned Baldor earlier on. If you, if you looked at the list price of a Baldor motor from their catalog and looked at our prices, our, our list prices are probably a little bit lower um, than um, uh, those motors, but not significantly. So they're in the same order of magnitude as price in general. Um, on, on the one to three horsepower, I think as as the as the horsepower range grows, as as um, was indicated in the slides earlier, um, we, we we probably have a, a bigger advantage there. Uh, Charles, do you have any data points on permanent magnet motors as it relates to uh, cost comparisons? Yeah, that's a good question. Now it's difficult to make a comparison because quite often it's not an apples to apples comparison. Uh, the reason being ECMs or permanent magnet motors generally aren't available commercially in sizes larger than three or five horsepower, right? You might get larger sizes with um, outer rotor permanent magnet motors, but that's a very different product where the fan uh, motor and VFD are built into one package. Um, but general purpose motors such as what we're uh, working on here for the HVAC market aren't really met, uh, you, you won't really find a good permanent magnet equivalent for them. Well, thank you, gentlemen, and thank you, everyone, for participating in this outbreak. Um, Andrea, I'll just give the, the mic to you to close this out. Um, great. Thanks, everyone, for being um, on, on with us on the webinar and for staying late. Um, as we mentioned at the top of the call, um, uh, you can, if you uh, complete the survey, you can receive continuing education credit. And please reach out directly to Michael Hobson if you don't receive a copy of the survey. And with that, thank you. Thank you to all the presenters, and thank you to all the participants and your um, excellent questions.